Letter 100 of Selected Letters of St. Jane Francis de Chantal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selected Letters of St. Jane Francis de Chantal by St. Jane Francis de Chantal. To Monsieur Noël Brûlard commander de sillery at paris vive jesus valence second july sixteen thirty six my most honoured beloved and dearest father i certainly have no wish to delay in answering your kind and cordial letter which gives such a lucid account of the finale of this wicked affair footnote we quote the following extract from the History of the Foundation of the Visitation Order. Quote, a person of good social position had, it is said, borrowed a very large sum of money from the second monastery of the Visitation at Paris, promising immediately to send a written acknowledgment of this loan and to repay it at the end of a fortnight. But upon receiving the money, he at once absconded. Informed of his departure, Mother Marie Agnes Leroy took active steps to recover the money, which was the entire capital of her community. The immediate result of her inquiries was that the affair became public, and the friends of the accused, who were very numerous, all took his part and spread the grossest calumnies against the victims of his treachery. But God, taking charge of their defence, providentially brought back to Paris the culprit, who thus fell into the hands of those who were seeking him. He made restitution, in so far as to acknowledge with confusion that he had taken the money, intending to speculate with it, but he appears to have been unable to restore to the convent the entire sum. End quote. The nuns claimed no other punishment for him than the avowal of his discreditable conduct. End footnote. And, above all, of the good odor of those little servants of the Lord, our sisters of the Faubourg, and of the reparation made to them. Oh, how good God is, and how prompt in coming, by ways which confound the prudence of the worldly wise, to the succor of the innocent. For the greatness of his mercies, may he be for ever blessed you must have been deeply moved in the goodness of your heart on witnessing such a marked and fatherly interposition of providence in this grave crisis truly happy are the souls who repose entirely in the pitying and loving bosom of this heavenly father you cannot think what this grace has wrought in my heart towards god whom we can never sufficiently thank for it and towards you, my very dear father, for the incomparable assistance which you have given these poor daughters of mine. It is quite impossible to express to you what I feel, and always shall feel, for the succor and the support in all our necessities which God has given us through you is a priceless treasure from which we draw both spiritual and temporal profit. May the sweet Saviour bless you with his richest graces and recompense you with his divine love. My poor sisters needed this experience so that they might learn to trust themselves entirely to your paternal care. They have written to me expressing their gratitude and begging of me to help them to return you fitting thanks. It is a sweet providence, I cannot but think, that has permitted the evil act of that miserable man, so that by means of it a more complete union should be established between our two monasteries of Paris, and that our Lord should have made use of you as the bond of union, for they themselves recognize this, and write of it to me. God be blessed. This story deserves to be recorded for posterity, but if it is possible, I should be glad to know every circumstance of it in detail, for, from certain things that have been written to me, 
it seems as if this man took the money to invest it for the benefit of our sisters i want to know the truth about this and for what object it was confided to him my sister the superior of the faubourg tells me that on sunday evening when i had said adieu to her monsieur de la moignon took fifty four thousand francs of it to buy an office for his son i am asking sister to write to me about this matter for you must not trouble to do so we have visited our houses of pont saint esprit avignon montpellier arles aix and marseilles where certainly everything is blessed and in all of which the observance is kept with great exactitude it is most consoling to see on all sides how the sisters love and esteem their vocation all these houses have excellent superiors when at aix we saw those of digne draguignon grasse and forcalquier the four are invaluable mothers capable of putting their hands to anything in which divine providence may employ them and of rendering all manner of good service to god and the institute we also met at aix the superiors of cisteron apt and toulon humble and virtuous souls but not possessing the useful talents of the first four in returning from provence i stopped at our house of crest where i again found very good sisters with a young mother of thirty but of a capable mind judicious and zealous she keeps straight to the grand road of the rule for fear she says of going astray she gave me great satisfaction now i am at valence where it appears to me the community is feeling somewhat the effects of having had young superiors for eight years in succession nevertheless they keep to the exterior observance and manifest an ardent desire to profit by our stay i have not yet spoken with them but i intend to do so the superior is good gentle capable and willing but is wanting in experience this please god will come these sisters are in need of one who is firm and experienced i hope as next year will be that of their election that god will look after them in this matter according to their needs pardon my bad writing but i forget half i wish to say we went from marseilles to sainte baume a place of great devotion always your very humble obedient and obliged daughter and servant in our lord end of letter one hundred letter one hundred one of selected letters of st jane francis de chantal this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michelle selected letters of st jane francis de chantal by st jane francis de chantal letter one hundred one to mother marie agne lois superior of the second monastery of paris vive jesus valence sixteen thirty six my well beloved and dearest daughter for this indeed you are to me in so peculiar and intimate a way that no dearer term can i add to it and no other feeling than this loving one could my heart entertain towards you seeing the way in which you look upon the true and solid lights and affections of heart that god has given you my daughter i am quite enchanted with your letter i cannot keep myself from kissing it and pressing it to my heart for every word of it from beginning to end has deeply moved me i shall carefully treasure it nothing else have i to say my true daughter if not that you ought in order fully and worthily to correspond with such graces to keep your heart firmly set on god and casting out all that is not he jealously and faithfully preserve the rare treasure which the divine goodness has confided to your hands spread the good odor all you can in the hearts of your daughters and may every one who comes in contact with you feel that the virtues of the crucified and despised saviour go out from you recommend my heart with your own to him and let them be as one in his divine love footnote 
This letter, which so charmed St. Jane Francis, contained an account of the intimate feelings of Mother Marie Agnès Leroy, when she found herself under the calumny spoken of in the preceding letter to the commander de Sillery. To quote from her letter, It seems to me, she says, that it is a particular grace to have been chosen to bear this humiliation. Our Lord is so good that he gives me very great pleasure and contentment in it, because it shows his very special love for me, and seeing it has all happened to imprint in my heart the spirit of lowliness and humility, I am greatly consoled and incited to redouble my little efforts to procure him glory. Ah, my dear mother, how wise such occurrences make us, and what fruit they bear! From the History of the Foundation of the Second Monastery of Paris End of footnote End of letter 101letter 102 of selected letters of saint jean francis de chantal this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michelle selected letters of saint jean francis de chantal by saint jean francis de chantal letter 102 to sister anne louise de marin de saint michel Superior at Four Calquier. Vive Jesus, Annecy, April 5th, 1637. My dearest daughter, may our most gentle Saviour in His goodness fill our souls with the merit of His holy passion. Alas, my daughter, if you knew me such as I really am, you would not desire many years of life for me in this valley of tears, but rather that God in His merciful goodness should soon take me to Himself still less should you think that sanctity was ripe in me for truly all i can discover within my soul is very great poverty and misery to speak quite in confidence to you and to you alone it has pleased the divine goodness to deprive me of all light and consolation and to let me be overwhelmed with darkness and affliction in a word i am she for whom our good mother has asked you to pray and i beseech you to do it with all the compassionate affection and the loving charity which god has put into your heart for me for indeed dearest daughter i am in sore need of your prayers no other desire am i conscious of save that god may hold me in his blessed hands and so keep me from offending him to do and suffer all for and according to his good pleasure is enough for me i tell you all quite openly in order that you might speak of me to the heart of our divine saviour whom i bless and thank for the graces that he continues to bestow upon you with the growth of that intimate realization of his divine presence. Oh, how precious, how glorious is this grace! Yet this gift of his presence is not the same as his presence in the divine sacrament, where his sacred body and soul and divinity all in the most real sense dwell with us, and remain with us in our miserable tabernacles until the species is consumed. Nevertheless, in the gift of the presence of God, this eternal truth remains in us, by essence, by power, and by grace, and to be conscious of this is an exceptional favor. You will understand this better by reading the books that treat of it. In the treatise of Divine Love, I think you will find it admirably explained. What I now tell you I have learnt there or heard in sermons. Oh, what a happiness for a soul to possess her God in peace, and to be possessed entirely by Him. I am surprised that what I say contents you, and gives you peace but it is because our good god makes all things work to good for those who love him once again i beseech of you to recommend me to his divine mercy and i pray that in you he may perfect his rare graces all you have to do is leave yourself in the hands of this heavenly workman and to be very faithful in paying no heed to what passes in you but always keep the eye of your mind fixed on god of a truth i desire myself to be very attentive to this point but my mind is so restless that I am not able to do so. And this is a constant trouble to me. See how I give you all my confidence? Will you not also tell me your thoughts? And it will be a consolation and a profit to me, if God so wills. May he bless you and all your sisters to whose devout prayers I recommend myself. Those amongst us are most blessed who long for the holy perfection of their vocation. Divine providence, when it sees well, will increase their number 
neither will it fail to provide all things necessary for the maintenance of those who leave themselves in its care and only think of conforming to its good pleasure. Believe me, always yours entirely in our Lord. May he be blessed. Palm Sunday. On this day, Holy Church bids us sing, The Savior comes in the multitude of his mercies. May our souls eternally praise him. Amen. End of letter 102. Letter 103 of Selected Letters of St. Jean Francis de Chantal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selected Letters of St. Jean Francis de Chantal by St. Jean Francis de Chantal. Letter 103 to the Abbe de Vaux. Vive Jesus. Annecy, 1637. My very dear and very honorable brother, may the sacred love of our divine Savior be our eternal life. The little preface or pretended excuse in your letter is not quite in keeping with the simple confidence with which we have resolved to treat each other, which I believe God desires and ratifies, and with the profession you make of wishing to live in the entire simplicity and candor of the visitation spirit, which one certainly cannot but see in you. I bless God for it with all my heart and know not how to thank him for his infinite goodness in having given such a friend to our congregation, and such a support to the new plant which Providence has set in the garden of the Church of Angers. Now I say all this straight out from my heart. Will you not receive it then in this wise, my very dear brother, and unite with me in praising God? For to him we owe it all. He is the sole author of all good things, hence should all glory be referred to him. Your whole bearing with our sisters is extremely pleasing to me. Sister Mary Euphrasia Turpin has a good heart, a fine intelligence, and loves the rule, which I advise her closely to follow above all in the guidance of her novices. Will you not also give her this advice? You will find her pliant, open, and easy to convince. We must let Mother Claire Madeleine de Pierre complete her three years. Footnote. Each election in the visitation monasteries is for a period of three years. End of footnote. And I hope by that time Divine Providence will have provided a successor. It is a very serious matter in a new foundation when a superior is often ill and cannot follow the common life. By seeking pretexts, without necessity to dispense herself, however little, from the exercises, she does great harm to herself and her community she who ought to be a model of good example to her sisters. How miserable and dangerous is false liberty! May God preserve us from it! What responsibility have not such superiors on their consciences? And what an account they will have to render, not only for their own faults, but for those which have been committed in imitation of them, and for repeating their own perfection and that of those under their care! This is far-reaching, my dear brother, so speak of it occasionally, I beg of you. A true daughter of the visitation is a great treasure. May God give us all the grace to become such. You do not tell me if the sisters are still in your house. How good you are to them. I pray God to reward you with the glorious gift of his eternal city. To him you owe much for having given you the heart and the generous soul you possess, wherein there is but one desire to serve him. Go forward, dear brother, forward, always advancing and increasing in the purity and perfection of divine love. And may God give you the grace faithfully to correspond to the great favors he bestows upon you. This is, I know, your great wish, and I seem to see our blessed Father looking down upon you as one of his most cherished children. God knows how I esteem you in his sight. But alas, my own poverty and misery are beyond description. May God diminish them for the sake of his glory. I trust to his goodness and for the prayers that are offered for my needs. There is no doubt that this difficulty of not being able to make considerations in prayer leads to a more simple form of prayer, and a soul thus led ought to adhere to this way to which God is undoubtedly calling her, however faint may be the call. And although the calm and facility of dwelling reverently before him, which it brings, be but slight, neither ought she to forsake it because of her indigent state, nor because of her wanderings of mine, 
but remain patiently and tranquilly before our Lord, not giving willing consent to distractions, but when worried by them, just say from time to time words of submission, abandonment, confidence, and love of the divine will, and give up discoursing with the understanding. Indeed, it is useless to split our heads trying to do so, for it will be of no avail. The great secret of prayer is to follow our attraction and to go on in good faith. A soul who wishes to live in the presence of God should be very faithful to the practice of virtue, to great purity of heart, and to an unconditional surrender of herself in the divine will. When she sees herself walking in this way, she need fear nothing. But if she has great consolations and facilities in prayer without the practice of these virtues, she certainly ought to fear. Truly, this manner of prayer has in its simplicity a wonderful power of leading souls to a total despoliation of themselves. Yet they usually enjoy neither relish nor sensible devotion. Yours, etc. Footnote. Guy Lanier, Abbe de Vaux, not only put his own house at the disposal of the sisters' fantresses of the visitation at Angers, but continued in after years to give them constant proofs of his paternal affection. He was one of the most virtuous ecclesiastics of the seventeenth century. End of footnote. End of letter 103. Letter 104 of Selected Letters of St. Jane Frances de Chantal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Selected Letters of St. Jane Frances de Chantal by St. Jane Frances de Chantal. Letter 104 to a great servant of God. Vive Yeshu, Aneshi, December 1637. My very dear mother, may our Lord fill our souls with the consolations and with the merits of his most holy nativity. It is about a month since I received your letter of November 9th in which I read your true goodness and loving care of me in my never-ending trials. However, by the grace of God, they are somewhat less acute than when I last wrote. At that time our Lord had sent me a great sorrow in the death of the virtuous mother de Châtel, who is a serious loss to me. It seems as if God wishes to deprive me of all help, both of nature and of grace. This our blessed Father prophesied to me before I was a religious. With all my heart I adore the most holy will of God, and the only good I desire is its complete fulfillment. May I have the grace never to resist it. If it is perfectly wrought out in me, how happy I shall be. Pray for this, dearest mother, I beg of you. Strange to say, when writing to you, I can never altogether keep back my tears, though otherwise I rarely weep, unless perchance when I reflect upon those precious virtues. Footnote A. The following extract from a letter of St. Francis to Madame de Chantal, March 28, 1612, tells us what these virtues were. He says, But let us come to the interior trial which you write to me about. It is in reality a certain insensibility which deprives you of the enjoyment not only of consolations and inspirations, but also of faith, hope, and charity. You have them all the time, and in a very good condition, but you do not enjoy them. In fact, you are like an infant whose guardian takes away from him the administration of all his goods in such sort that, while in reality all is his, yet he handles and seems to possess no more than what he requires for living. And, as St. Paul says in this, He differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all things. In the same way, my dear daughter, God does not want you to have the management of your faith, your hope, or of your charity, nor to enjoy them except just to live, and to use them on occasions of pure necessity. End of footnote A Of which I feel deprived, and thoughts against them rise up within me that are like daggers to my heart. 
Yet I am conscious that these divine treasures exist, but where I know not, and it seems to me that I do at least desire them and would willingly suffer anything in order to have the enjoyment of them. My mind pictures untold delights for souls who possess them. Were I to dwell on this thought, I should be parched up with sorrow, because I care for nothing in comparison with them. Could I be so fortunate as to die for Holy Church, nay, even for the least article of our faith, how happy I should be, for, thank God, there is no point that I doubt about though it seems to me that I am destitute of all faith. To tell you further, dearest mother, shortly after my last letter to you, it pleased the divine goodness somewhat to relieve me of the great oppression and desolation from which I was then suffering, by giving me a sensible feeling of the divine presence. I have already told you that I have never been altogether without some slight and almost imperceptible feeling of the presence of God, by which, in the midst of a storm of troubles and temptations, my spirit never wholly loses its tranquillity, and as long as I maintain myself in that presence, my soul is calm, notwithstanding the piteous struggle. When it first pleased our Lord to give me some relief in the terrible temptations under which I labored for so many years after I made my vow, Footnote B. On September 2, 1604, St. Jane Francis made a vow of perpetual chastity and of obedience to St. Francis de Sales. From this time until her death, she suffered from temptations against faith in varying intensity. On October 4th of this same year, 1604, St. Francis wrote to her, You ask a remedy for the temptations against faith which assail you. Never argue with them, but do as the children of Israel, who threw the bones of the paschal lamb into the fire without attempting to break them. And again, O oh my daughter, it is a good sign when the enemy urges so vehemently from without, it is a sign that he is not within. End of footnote B. I received the grace of a simple consciousness of his presence at prayer, and remaining in it, I used to surrender myself up to him and become absorbed and at rest in him. This favor has not been withdrawn from me, notwithstanding that by my infidelities I have often hindered it, yielding to apprehensions that I should be useless in this state, and, wanting to do something on my own part, I used to spoil all. I am still often subject to this same fear, not, however, when at prayer, but at other exercises. I am always wanting to make acts or to do something, and yet I feel that by so doing I am taking myself from my center, that this looking straight at God alone is the only remedy for me, the sole relief in all the troubles, temptations, and accidents of life. If I followed my attraction, I should certainly never seek any other way than this, for when I think to fortify my soul by reflections and discourses, or by acts of resignation, for all of which I have to do violence to self, I only succeed in exposing myself to fresh troubles and temptations, and finding therein naught but dryness and dissatisfaction, I have perforce to return to this simple surrender to God. Apparently he wishes thus to show me that he desires, on this subject, a total cutting off of the activities and workings of my mind, so that his activity, and not mine, should undertake the care of all. Mayhap he requires this of me, not only on the subject of faith, but on all others as well. For in every trouble, and in every spiritual exercise, to look at him is all that he seems to want of me, and the more unwaveringly I do so, the better I find myself and the quicker my troubles pass. But the activity of my mind is such that I am always in need of comfort and encouragement. Alas, my dearest father often spoke to me of this. Yet recalling the past, I see that my sufferings at that time were not the troubles I now endure. 
Then it was only my distracted prayers and such like trifles that troubled and sometimes deceived me, for which I am not sorry, as there was no real danger. God was there, and I had only to keep myself steadfast to Him. But in my present trials I am as one always on the edge of a precipice. Our late mother, Peron de Châtel, was an immense help to me, for she taught me to walk with simplicity, firmly and fearlessly in the presence of God, and that sufficed for all. The more completely I am stripped of all sentiment, all relish, all repose in God, the more do I seem to gain strength and peace of soul, and the more clearly do I see that there is nothing to lean upon but God alone, purely and simply. One of our sisters, footnote C, Sister Anne Marie Rosette, and a footnote C, is drawn by this absolute detachment to a degree that it is almost impossible to surpass, and our good mother, de Chatel, told me that God gave this sister to me as an example to follow. She wrote, at the request of our late mother, an account of her interior state, to which I have added in detail. She is a soul of great virtue, and her detachment is marvelous. Speaking of this, some days ago our Lord gave me a light so vivid and set it before me in a manner so luminous that I saw, without a shadow of doubt, that I must no longer cast my eyes upon myself about anything whatsoever, nor even question my beloved, but in all simplicity and repose become absorbed in him. Now, since this day of alleviation, it seems to me that I have kept myself more continuously in God's presence and I have but seldom had those violent temptations, only two or three times. This is, I think, all that I can give myself time to say at present. If I have not expressed myself well to this distinguished servant of God, you will not fail to understand me, and will tell me what he says. Yours, etc. End of letter 104. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Letter 105 of Selected Letters of St. Jane Frances de Chantal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Twinkle Selected Letters of St. Jane Frances de Chantal Letter 105 To Mother Maria Me Darabutan, Superior at Thunon Vive Jesus! Aneshi, October 15, 1639 My dearest daughter, may God be always blessed in all things, and may he be particularly blessed for the good health you tell me you enjoy and for the care you take to do all that is prescribed to keep you well. I am sending you a box of lozenges. Take them as directed, besides the other remedies. I beg of you to take them regularly, for they are sweet, not unpleasant, and very inexpensive. Do not, I beseech of you, undertake any extra fasting, nor abstain more than you can easily manage. Continue cheerfully to make use of the little alleviations that are settled for you, and any others that your weakness may require, just as you would see that others did. Drink your wine, at least half your portion, for your wine cups are very small. Footnote. These wine cups held about two small glasses. End footnote. Neither rise earlier nor go to bed later than the others nor undertake any laborious work, for I know your health would not stand it. Take the discipline only on Fridays. Possess your spirit in peace and calm, and pass gently through this miserable life, not taking too much to heart the faults of your sisters, nor their little ways of worrying you. Do your best amongst them, and leave the rest to God. Pray, and get prayers, 
that it may please God to turn the miseries and calamities of this world to his glory and to the salvation of his people, and do not forget me. If you would like me to write to Sister J. Antoine, I will do so. However, she must be kept to the promises she made to me. Tell her that I have spoken to you about them, and have asked you to let me know how she is going on. May God be your support. Blessed be he and his holy mother. Amen. End of letter 105letter 106 of selected letters of st jane francis de chantal this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by christine layman reseda california selected letters of st jane francis de chantal by st jane francis de chantal letter 106 to St. Vincent de Paul at Paris. On the arrival of the Lazarist fathers at Aneshi. Vive Yeshu! Aneshi, 1640. My very dear Father, praised be our divine Savior, who, for his great glory and the salvation of many souls, has brought your dear children happily here. Their coming is a subject of thanksgiving to our Lord from every one but most of all from the Bishop of Geneva and myself, to whom it is an unbounded consolation. We look upon them as our true brothers, with whom, in simple open-heartedness and confidence, we are as one, and they too feel this. I have had a conversation with them, and truly they speak as if they were daughters of the visitation. All are full of goodness and candor. The third and the fifth need a little help to get out of themselves. I shall tell their superior, Monsieur Escart, of it. He is a saint, and a man truly equal to his charge. I have given them each a practice of virtue. With God's help, for our mutual consolation and to obey you, I will always lovingly continue to do so. For indeed, my dear father, there is much to speak of to these dear souls. The good father N. has manifested his own difficulties to me with the utmost simplicity. He has an upright heart and a good judgment, but it will be difficult for him to persevere. I have begged of him to put aside all thought of either leaving or staying, and to apply himself in good earnest to do God's work, leaving himself trustfully to his providence. I wish he could settle down, as he is a soul of great promise. In fact, they are all charming, and have already given great edification in this town during the three or four days that they have been here. Their spirit is very like that of my dear and good father. End of letter 106 Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California Letter 107 of Selected Letters of St. Jane Francis de Chantal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ken Hellenius. Blog.Hellenius.org. Selected Letters of St. Jane Francis de Chantal by St. Jane Francis de Chantal. Letter 107. To Sister Claire Marie Francois de Cousance at Gray. Footnote This religious belonged to the ancient family of the Counts of Bergen, Champlit, and Belvoir. At the age of thirteen, upon the foundation of the monastery of Champlit, she was taken there and given the title of foundress. Her arrival was the signal for a great ovation. Cannons boomed forth their welcome, while the magistrates harangued, and the people cheered her, acclaiming the great and good deeds of her ancestors. In this wise did the child enter into her new life of poverty, obedience, and chastity. Soon after her entrance, the war between France and Spain obliged the community to leave Champlit for the little town of Gray. Here, fresh trials awaited it. 
The plague broke out, and so awful were its ravages that the town was soon a veritable sepulchre. Yet none of the terrors that surrounded her shook the resolution of the brave child. Full of confidence in God, she remained calm and joyful in the midst of unheard-of privations. The fame of her courage and her virtue went abroad, and even before her profession she was the object of public veneration, for the people loved her and claimed her as their own heroine. At the age of sixteen, Sister Claire Marie Francois de Cousance made her solemn vows and became the Saint Stanislaus Kostka of the Visitation. She died two years after her profession, having spent those eighteen years of life more like an angel than a woman, and having enjoyed many supernatural communications. No sooner was her death known than the mayor ordered all the bells of the town of Grey to be tolled, on which the inhabitants at once announced their intention of assisting at the obsequies with torchlights to honor not so much her birth as her high virtue. The Visitation Monastery had not as yet a cemetery of their own, so the religious of the Annunciation, at their urgent request, were given the holy remains, which for some days they exposed to public veneration. Numerous were the graces obtained during those days by the devout inhabitants through the mediation of the holy nun. Her portrait was circulated in Flanders, where, like Sir Therese of Lisieux in our day, she was venerated though not yet on the altars of the church. Fourteen days after the obsequies had been celebrated, a religious of the Annunciation wrote to the Mother Superior of the Visitation at Gray, quote, This dear deceased is still quite beautiful, and her body quite flexible. The veins are to be seen in her person as in a living body, which proves to us that it was truly the temple of a pure and angelic soul. Several persons have noticed a fragrant perfume exhaling from the coffin, and others have received extraordinary graces and interior illumination when praying beside it. End quote. Taken from Volume 9 of The Lives of the Sisters of the Visitation. End footnote. Vive Jesus. Annecy, 1640. My dearest daughter, your letter fills me with tender compassion, but it also gives me very real comfort seeing how joyfully God is enabling you to make your passage through this life to Him. You will love and adore Him in an eternity of glory, for this is the only good that is worth setting our hearts upon. Here we are all regretting your absence and envying you your happiness, but our regret and our envy are more than balanced by our gratitude to God, who is taking you so mercifully to Himself. Oh, how hard and long is this life for those who yearn to be with Him! You must do, my daughter, as your good mother desires about your state of health. Most earnestly do I beg of you to ask God that I may live and die in His grace and according to His good pleasure. Do not refuse me this favor. And when you see him, do not forget to speak to him about me. Be kind to me in this. I remain yours affectionately in his love. Amen. End of letter. Recording by Ken Hellenius. Blog.hallenius. dot org. Letter 108 of the Selected Letters of St. Jane Francis de Chantal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ken Hellenius. Blog.Hellenius.org. Selected Letters of St. Jane Francis de Chantal by St. Jane Francis de Chantal. Letter 108. To Sister Jean Benin Gojos, lay sister at Turin. Footnote Sister Jean Benin Gojos died at Turin in the odor of sanctity, November 5, 1692. Her life was written under the title of The Charm of Divine Love, and it possesses all the beauty of true mysticism. It is hoped that one day she may be raised to the altars of the church. St. Jane Francis said of her, quote, From the day of her profession, she seemed no longer to be on earth. End quote. End footnote. Vive Jesus. 
Annecy, 1640. My daughter, most dear, your few words explaining your interior occupation have made your soul as clear to me as if it lay open before mine eyes. All that passes within you and without you is God's own work. Regarding your interior life, my advice is, give God a free hand to do as He likes, while you look on in loving simplicity. And as to the exterior, practice virtue by making faithful use from moment to moment of the opportunities provided by divine providence. But it is superfluous for me to offer advice, as the heart that is governed by God needs no other guidance. Beseech of him, in his goodness, my dear daughter, to accomplish in us his holy will, without let or hindrance on our part. Yours, etc. End of letter. Recording by Ken Hellenius. Blog.hallenius. dot org. Letter 109 of the Selected Letters of St. Jane Francis de Chantal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ken Hellenius. Blog.Hellenius.org. Selected Letters of St. Jane Francis de Chantal by St. Jane Francis de Chantal. Letter 109. To the Sister Louise Angelique de Lafayette at the First Monastery of Paris. A footnote. Marie-Louise Motier de Lafayette became maid of honor to Anne of Austria at the age of fourteen. Her beauty and the promise of great ability for which she was afterwards so remarkable attracted the king, Louis XIII. His devotion to her, which lasted all his life, was that of a brother to a most dear sister. He turned to her in his troubles and relied and acted on her advice. When, at the age of nineteen, she decided to retire into the monastery of the Visitation, for which she had not ceased to long during her short life at court, the king opposed her vocation, but seeing that her happiness was bound up with it, he at last gave his consent. Yet he never ceased to visit this devoted friend who continued to exercise over him a wise and salutary influence. Richelieu, jealous of her power with the king, was sensibly relieved by her entrance into religion. However, hearing one day that Louis had spent three hours at the Rue Saint-Antoine with this young religious, he was thoroughly frightened, and sending for Père Cazin, the king's confessor, he said, quote, I am greatly astonished that the king has made such a mystery to me of this visit. It has caused a great sensation, and the public are persuaded that the consequences of it will be serious. My friends have come to offer to defend me at the peril of their lives. Quote, what can you mean, Monsignor? replied the Jesuit father. Surely you do not fear Mademoiselle de Lafayette. She is but a child. You are a simple man, replied the cardinal, pressing the priest's hand, but you will have to learn the wickedness of the world. Know then that this child has had it in her mind to ruin all. Notwithstanding the discontent, nay, even the abject terror of the powerful cardinal, Louis continued his visits, which always took place in the grilled parlor, for although as king he had a right to enter the monastery, he never took advantage of this royal privilege. Upon the foundation of the monastery of Chaillot, for which Henrietta Maria of England herself chose the house, Mademoiselle de Lafayette, now Sister Louise Angelique, was sent as one of the foundresses, and was elected superior there on the decease of Mother Louillier. After the death of Louis XIII, Louis the Fourteenth, Charles the Second, and James the Second of England, Anne of Austria, and Marie Therese all continued to frequent the monastery in order to learn how to sanctify respectively their triumphs or their misfortunes. The unfortunate Queen Henrietta Maria took up her residence there. Mademoiselle d'Amuel, afterwards Queen of Poland, 
the Princess Louise Hollandine, daughter of Frederick V of Bohemia, the champion of Protestantism in Germany, and granddaughter of James I of England, were instructed by and lived with the nuns. Later, Marie Beatrice, widow of James II, lived at the monastery. Yet all this concourse of the great ones of the world did not tarnish the virtue nor dissipate the mind of that lover of solitude and of penance, Louise Angelique de Lafayette. She died as superior at Chaulieu, January 11, 1665, loved and venerated by all who knew her. It is little known that the world owes the birth of Louis the Fourteenth to the wise advice of this holy nun, who pressed home upon the king his conjugal duty. Taken from, firstly, the original manuscript letter of Père Cousin S.J. to Sister de Lafayette, found amongst her papers after her death. Secondly, from the memoirs of Madame de Motteville, a personal friend of Sister de Lafayette, Thirdly, from the history of Louis the Thirteenth by Père Griffet, who had recourse to the memoir of Père Cousin for these incidents. Vive Jesus! Annecy, 1641. My dearest daughter, though not personally acquainted with you, nonetheless do I know and dearly love you. Your letter shows me quite clearly the state of your mind and the source of your trouble and embarrassment. It comes from your over-eagerness in seeking to arrive at the perfection you desire instead of patiently and submissively awaiting the will of him alone who can give it to you. Now, if you wish truly to acquire the spirit of your vocation, you will have to correct this fault and carry out whatever instructions are given you gently and faithfully, repressing your desires and your thoughts, in order, in God's good time, to become a true visitation nun. I think, if I am not mistaken, that you are not content simply to make acts requisite for your training in perfection, but you want to feel and be conscious that you have made them. This satisfaction you should give up, and content yourself with saying to God without sensible feeling, quote, I wish with all my heart to perform such and such practices of virtue for thy good pleasure, end quote. Then, perform them, although with dryness, and wish for nothing better than in this manner lovingly to serve him. If you do this, you will soon find yourself in possession of that calm and holy peace so necessary to souls who desire to live by the Spirit, and not according to their own views and inclinations. Your repose and spiritual advancement depend, I can see, on these things. May God fill you with himself and give you the grace to practice all that is taught you by her to whose guidance he has committed you. I am affectionately yours. End of letter. Recording by Ken Hellenius. Blog.halleneus.org. Letter 110 of Selected Letters of St. Jane Francis de Chantal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle. Selected Letters of St. Jean Francis de Chantal by St. Jean Francis de Chantal. Letter 110. To Madame the Duchess de Montmorency, ne des Ursins. Vive Jésus. Moulin, 19th of June, 1641. My very honored and very dear Madame, and by divine grace our true and beloved sister, I bless and thank our good God for enabling you so courageously to show forth the power of his divine love. Your entrance into religion will be for his greater glory and for the happiness of our little congregation. O oh, my dearest sister, my well-beloved of God, and with what overflowing consolation you have filled my soul! I have just received your letter, which has been a long time on the road, and I now write in haste not to lose the opportunity of this messenger who goes direct to Lyon, as I am anxious to tell you that I consider that in no way have I now either the strength or the capacity to undertake the superiorship of any of our monasteries. The bishop and our sisters, the latter very unwillingly, 
have partly consented not to have me re-elected here. Still I assure you that if his lordship gives me an obedience to go to you, I do not think I could possibly have a command more to my liking. And I pray that God, if this is his will, that he may inspire the bishop to send me. It would be an immense consolation to me to give the veil to one so full of desire as you are to receive the true spirit of our blessed Father. May our good God complete in you the high perfection which he has so gloriously begun. I am most truly your poor, humble, and unworthy servant in our Lord, etc. Footnote. When becoming a postulant at the visitation, the Duchess de Montmorency wished not only to renounce her titles of nobility, but also to change her baptismal name of Marie Félice, a custom which was not usual at the time. She was named Marie after Marie de Medici, and Felice after her maternal uncle Felix Peretti, Pope Sixtus V. At her clothing she dropped these names and was henceforth known only as Sister Marie Henriette. She became superior at Moulins some years after the death of St. Jane Francis. End of footnote. End of letter 110. Letter 111 of Selected Letters of St. Jane Francis de Chantal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California. Selected Letters of St. Jane Francis de Chantal by St. Jane Francis de Chantal. Letter 111 to a novice. Vive Yeshu. Undated. My very good and dear brother, I have been absent for four weeks, and only yesterday on my return received your letter. It gave me, I assure you, very great consolation, and I am full of gratitude to the God of divine goodness for his mercies to you. The evil spirit cannot give this attraction you speak of. He draws us away from good. On the other hand, our loving Saviour sheds his perfume in our hearts, so that young souls may be drawn to follow him by the sweetness of his odour. Rejoice, then, in this grace with great humility, my dearest brother, and by means of it grow stronger in your vocation and in the practice of all virtue, above all in that of self-renunciation, so that you may advance in union of soul with God. Give yourself wholly into his hands. That done, have no fear of the evil spirit, but of God alone. For, having quitted all things and yourself in your desire to belong to him, Satan can do you no harm. Go forward quite simply, ruminating but little. The affection I feel for you, as a mother for her son, draws from me these words of advice but I know the best counsel is not wanting to you where you are. May God lead you himself to the height of perfection to which he has called you, and always keep you within his holy hand. I never forget to ask this of his goodness, neither do you forget me when speaking to him. Believe me, I am, and always will be, your most affectionate, etc. End of letter 111. End of selected letters of St. Jane Francis de Chantal by St. Jane Francis de Chantal. Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California.